The National Desk, America's News, now. This week on The National Desk, the string of shootings impacting America's youth. Going up the wrong driveway by mistake is certainly not grounds in New York anyways to be shot at. Some now asking for clarification on stand your ground laws. Then the strange system at the southern border. Our team on the ground investigates how the end of Title 42 could impact border towns. Plus alien origins, the latest Pentagon effort to review hundreds of reported UFOs. What experts are saying about the potential for extraterrestrial activity. Clearly there's some unusual phenomenon that's going on. It definitely deserves attention. And later vying for votes. The fact check team investigates the importance of independent voters ahead of the 2024 race for the White House. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dee Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. New questions on stand your ground laws, how several recent shootings involved in youth are playing into it. Electrical vehicle push, how the country's lack of infrastructure for the cars could set back the president's plan. The debate over transgender athletes continues. Right now, the new measure passed in the House impacting women's sports. Plus, the prominent potential candidate that could announce their bid for the White House as soon as next week. After recent shootings of people who went to the wrong address, some are asking for clarification on stand your ground laws. The National Desk Kayla Gaskins looks at what the law was and was not designed to do. In a two day span, two young people were shot after approaching the wrong houses. Going up the wrong driveway by mistake is certainly not grounds in New York anyways to be shot at. In New York, 20 year old Kaylin Gill is shot and killed after pulling into the wrong driveway. 65 year old Kevin Monahan now charged with her murder. In Missouri, 16 year old Ralph Yarl is recovering from two gunshot wounds after knocking on the wrong door when picking up his little brothers from a play date. 84-year-old Andrew Lester was charged with first-degree assault and faces life in prison. It is one of the most astonishing, shameful stories that I think I've heard about in some time. Both cases raising the question, what rights do homeowners have to shoot someone on their property? At least 30 states have some version of stand your ground laws where someone has no duty to retreat when met with a threat. Missouri is one of them. We spoke with former federal prosecutor Theru Viknaraja. Could the shooter in Missouri use stand your ground in his defense? Look, it's going to be very difficult. In no state in the country has stand your ground doctrine been interpreted to say you can use lethal force even when you don't have a reasonable fear of imminent physical harm. Otherwise, you could shoot a Girl Scout. New York doesn't have a stand your ground law, and Vignaraja says a similar law there won't help Gillis's alleged shooter. The mayor of Kansas City, meanwhile, says race was the key factor in the shooting of Ralph Yarl. This defendant in the probable cause statement is indicated to have said he was afraid of Ralph because he is a, a tall black man. Critics argue the racial component caused Jarl's case to receive significantly more coverage despite similarities to Gillis's. As of Wednesday, Google showing 124,000 results for Jarl and just under 13,000 for Gillis. President Biden has called the Jarl family. No reports of him calling the Gillis's. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump is reacting to the shootings of Kaylin Gillis and Ralph Yarl. Some believe Yarl's attack was racially motivated. Crump, who is representing Yarl in court, says despite the victim's different races, the outrage should be the same for both cases. Race does not change the need for justice in either of these cases. If you were outraged at the shooting of Ralph Yarl, you should be outraged at the shooting death of Kaylin Gillis. That is what humanity requires. The men accused in both cases each appeared in court this week. Andrew Lester pleading not guilty to felony charges related to the shooting of Ralph Yarl. Kevin Monahan was denied bail as he faces murder charges. 
House Republicans just passed a first of its kind bill to ban transgender athletes from competing on school sports teams with women and girls. National Desk Kayla Gaskins explains what's next. Advocates say it's about protecting women. All of the glass ceilings that have been shattered by women in sports have been for naught if we allow this to continue. On Thursday, the Republican-led House passing a bill essentially banning transgender women from competing in female sports at federally funded schools by requiring Title IX compliance to recognize sex at birth. For years, the left has said to follow the science. Well, today, Republicans are following the science. We are not confused about the differences uh, between biological men and biological women. Every House Democrat voting against. The other side does not even want to acknowledge that transgender kids exist. Prominent ESPN host Samantha Ponder coming out in support of the GOP bill with a tweet ending in the hashtag Save Women's Sports. Ponder seemingly bucking her employer. ESPN's coverage has featured trans athletes, even naming trans swimmer Leah Thomas an honoree for Women's History Month. Former University of Kentucky swimmer Riley Gaines tied Leah Thomas at nationals, but there was just one trophy to take home. NCAA officials gave it to Leah. This NCAA official reduced everything that I had worked my entire life for, every girl at that meet had worked their entire life for, down to a photo op for a male. In 2020, full measures, Cheryl Atkinson sat down with three Connecticut high school athletes who had to compete against trans women. Have all of you lost races and competitions to biological males? Yes, we all have. Okay. How many races? Too many to count. Some on the left saying simply debating the issue is leading to harm. This mere debate has traumatized trans kids and their families across the country. The legislation has virtually no shot of passing the Democratic-led Senate and the White House saying President Biden would veto the bill in the slim chance it lands on his desk. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. The 2024 presidential field could be getting more crowded next week. On Tuesday, President Biden is expected to make it official and announce plans to run for re-election. The announcement will reportedly be made via a video released to supporters. That date would coincide with the four-year anniversary of when he launched his 2020 bid. Charging up electric vehicles is costing more. The Energy Information Administration reports people used to pay about six bucks for a full charge are now paying 16. This week, the fact check team dug into the cost of implementing EV infrastructure across the country. The Biden administration targeting zero emissions by 2050. Right now, less than 1% of the 250 million cars on the roads are electric, though. I'm back with the fact check team tonight. A more immediate goal is having 50% of all new vehicle sales be electric vehicle sales by the year 2030. It's an aggressive goal, Janae. What are some <laughs> of the obstacles? Well, Eugene, according to an analysis from McKinsey and Company, we would need 48 million EVs or 15% of all vehicles to be on the road by 2030 to achieve the president's goal. But that's going to take a while because only 17 million new cars are sold each year, and not all of those are EVs. But we did find that EV sales increased by 65% in 2022. Yeah, the upward sales trend really shows an increased uh, consumer interest in these EVs. But one concern, Connor, uh, has been the, the charging infrastructure across the country. Some saying that it's just not where it needs to be. Yeah, that's right, Eugene. But to help with that, in 2021, Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, which gives $7.5 billion to install half a million new charging stations across the U.S., by 2030. However, according to McKinsey and Company, the U.S. will need 1.2 million public charging stations to reach the president's goal. I mean, look, there's supply and demand, right? So demand should sort that out in the future. But one uh, concerning topic has been the manufacturing of the batteries. What can you tell us about those? Right, Eugene. Well, so many batteries, including the ones that power EVs, are made using cobalt. And 70% of that is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And children have been found working at some of those mining sites, which did lead the Department of Labor to list lithium batteries as a material that's known to be produced with child and forced labor. Yeah, important to note, though, that some car makers are turning to lithium iron phosphate batteries. Those don't use cobalt, and some of these car makers also pledging zero tolerance uh, for child labor. You can read more on this fact check team topic by scanning the QR code you see there on your screen or visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. Still ahead here on the National Desk, stopping sideshows, the new law in a California city targeting spectators.
The National Daz team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. This week we start in California where simply being a spectator at a street race may soon result in a fine in Fresno. Sideshows and street racing have become a growing problem in Fresno in recent years. On Easter Sunday, Fresno PD and the CHP sided nearly 170 people at sideshows. Take a look at the kids who come out to hear the engines roar and smell the tires smoking. We have a lot of kids who are under the age uh, of 18 who are becoming involved. Fresno City Council members Gary Bradefeld and Annalisa Perea are proposing an ordinance that targets spectators. Each person cited would face a $1,000 fine and six months in jail. We may have our city attorney prosecuting these cases with the goal of not plea bargaining any of them, so we hold these people fully accountable to the law. <laughs> Last year, Fresno police cited and arrested 379 people for reckless driving and sideshows. 62 people were cited for blocking roads. 441 had their vehicles impounded. However, with this city ordinance, being a bystander or an organizer will come with a cost. In other words, the adrenaline rush won't be free. Now over to New York, a 16-year-old convicted of murdering a Rochester man will now spend 15 years to life in prison. Adriel Riley was only 14 years old in 2021 when prosecutors say he and another teen intentionally set 53-year-old Stephen Amenhauser on fire. Amenhauser died in the hospital four days later, Rochester police issuing this warning. Not only was the act in itself disgusting, but you know, what led up to the act was disgusting. The failures in the system over the years and, and the individuals involved in this case. And people need to wake up and see what we're doing is not working. The other teen involved was sentenced last month to 25 years in prison. In Kentucky, more than 50 animal rights groups have signed a letter to state officials asking them to address what they call law enforcement's failure to act on illegal cockfights. The group say they have evidence of dozens of operations across the state, mostly in eastern Kentucky, but say law enforcement does nothing. The animal rights groups say cockfights are not only cruel, they promote illegal gambling, money laundering, and drug trafficking. Well, when you understand what happens at cockfights, you understand that these are illegal gambling houses. Uh, these are gambling houses that are sometimes dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars a single day. A spokesperson for the Kentucky State Police said the agency investigates complaints and tips regarding illegal activity to the fullest extent. The state attorney general's office said it will determine next steps when it receives the letter. Ahead here on the national desk, America's News Now, home price spike. How new mortgage rates out this week could impact potential buyers. Plus, eyes on the sky. The new Pentagon investigation into unidentified flying objects. It's going to take more of your money to buy a home. After five weeks of decline, mortgage rates rose this week to the highest level in a month. Now, the 30-year fixed-rate mortgage averaged 6.39%. Last year, it was 5.11%. Home prices, they've stabilized a bit. Freddie Mac's chief economist says tight supply and rates above 6% continue to make affordability an issue. The Mortgage Bankers Association expects mortgage rates to fall to around 5.5% by the end of the year. Now, earlier this week, the National Desk Jan Jeffco sat down with former White House economic advisor Steve Moore to get his take on lowering the national debt, plus the possibility of future interest rate hikes. 
<laughs> Speaker McCarthy, by the way, went to Wall Street. He says the GOP would agree to raise the borrowing limit in exchange for spending cuts. This is what the GOP has been saying all along. So let's talk about the astronomical debt our country is already facing and what happens if we continue at this level. Well, we've been talking about this, Jan, haven't we, for the last uh, couple of months, that at some point we're going to have this showdown between the House Republicans who want to bring, at least bring this debt a bit under control, and Joe Biden who's basically saying he won't negotiate, he wants to continue on the financial path that we're on. And I think that most people would agree that we can't do that, that this is a, this is a train wreck that we're headed towards if we continue to raise our borrowing uh, to, it's right now $32 trillion is our debt. Uh, Jan, and we're headed to 50 trillion if we stay on this course over the next eight or nine years. So there will be this clash between Joe Biden and the House Republicans. And what what the speaker said yesterday was, "Hey, we want some. We will raise the debt ceiling, but you have to agree to get us back onto the path towards a balanced budget." Right. Right. There's got to be some kind of limits when you talk about right. raising a debt limit. And and the interest payments alone, we, we talked about this, it's $400 billion on just $31 trillion of debt, on just 31. And I say that because we know it's increasing and increasing so much. But the, the thing is, when, when you think about just the interest payments alone, it's clearly unsustainable. So one aspect of McCarthy's plan is to get Americans back to work, which is what you've been talking about, how we need to get people back. Out of, out, of, out, of, out of the off, in the office and out of their houses, but specifically those who were on Medicaid and food stamps. How important is this, Steve? Well, first of all, let's address that issue of the, I think, as you said, $400 billion a year we're paying on interest payments. Jan, that number is supposed to, by the end of the decade, go to almost a trillion dollars in terms of just debt payments. <laughs> in other words, we'd be paying a trillion dollars just to pay off the interest on the debt. That's an extraordinary thing. We'd be paying more money for interest on the debt that we would on our entire national defense. And I think that should be very alarming to all Americans. Um, so by, you know, basically the plan is to pass at least a one year debt ceiling increase, but get a plan in place that starts to cut some of this spending. And you mentioned the idea of getting people back to work. Yeah, let's do that. Let's maybe provide some work incentives for the welfare programs to get people who've been on welfare now for three years since COVID hit back in the labor force. Uh, let's uh, produce more American energy here at home. And we could put more people to work then. And we could also raise uh, tax revenues from the receipts from the from the uh, oil and minerals that we mine. So there are a lot of ways we can bring this debt down, Jan, and I think a lot of sensible ways. Yeah, and also reduce energy costs if we started doing more domestic energy production here. Uh, one, one aspect uh, of this that they talked about, too, was defunding the IRS and reversing this, this $80 billion that was given to the agency. But, but, Steve, what are the chances we will see this? Is there enough votes in the Senate to overcome perhaps a veto by Biden? Well, remember that the Congress has the uh, power of the purse. The president can't spend money. He has to get the approval of Congress. And with Republicans having a majority in the House, they have essentially a one house veto. So I feel personally very strongly about this. I think most uh, Republicans do that the idea of giving the IRS 80,000 more agents, many of which would be used to harass you know, middle class people and conservatives and Republicans. We know that because it happened under the Obama administration. So the weaponization of the IRS, I think, is something that is it's very dangerous. One other quick thing on this, Jan, you may have seen the news that now the IRS is tracking uh, financial transactions as little as $600. So that means you go out and buy an air conditioner and the IRS wants to know about it. You know, if you have, I have some civil liberty concerns about the government knowing everything about my financial transactions. Yeah, the overreach there. A Federal Reserve governor reiterating that the central bank's job is not done. So what do you think? When they, when they meet again in two weeks, are we going to see uh, another interest rate hike? Well, remember, we've had, I think, nine, nine of these Jan, in the last year. So it just keeps going up and up and up and up. And of course, this is the cost of inflation. When you have inflation out of control, you have, the Fed has to pull back some of that money with these interest rate cut, uh, increases. My prediction is they'll do one or maybe two more uh, interest rate hikes because, look, gas prices are starting to creep up again uh, a little bit. And so why do people care about that? Because those those Fed interest rates, Jan, are tied to the mortgage rate you pay. Those are pay, uh, tied to your consumer debt interest rates. All you know, all the borrowing that we do, uh, the interest rates are tied to the federal funds rate. So this could be 
well, just look at housing. You know, if those interest, the mortgage rates continue to rise, it's gonna it's gonna price a lot of people out of the housing market. Steve Moore, always great to see you. Thanks for joining okay. us here. Have a great week. You too. Thank you. Still ahead here, the story's making headlines next week. From the next country said to visit the White House to the court appearance for a high-profile murder suspect. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now. A grand opening for a Wendy's in Virginia left customers disappointed. Look at that line. Dozens lined up at the door hoping to get free food, but no one ever showed up to open the restaurant. Then in Mississippi, a police officer found a gun in an unusual place during a traffic stop. Look here. The driver hid the weapon inside a quesadilla in a Taco Bell bag. He was later charged with possession of a controlled substance and tampering with physical evidence. And in Bogota, Colombia, environmental authorities reporting a hippo owned by drug kingpin Pablo Escobar was killed after being hit on the highway. The animals were brought into the country illegally, but with no natural predators in the area, they now number more than 100. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, the Bidens will host the president and first lady of South Korea for an official state visit at the White House Wednesday. The trip comes as the U.S. works to strengthen its ties in Asia to counter China's rising influence. And on Thursday, the first round of the NFL draft kicks off at 8 p.m. Eastern in Kansas City, Missouri. The Carolina Panthers have the first pick after trading with the Chicago Bears. Also next week, the man charged in the deadly stabbing of Cash App founder Bob Lee is set to appear in court for arraignment. Prosecutors saying he stabbed Lee over an apparent dispute involving his sister. UFOs taking over the discussion in Washington, D.C. after lawmakers held their second hearing on the topic in more than 50 years. Janae Bowens explains what the government is doing to defend the country against these potentially dangerous objects. UFOs are no longer just a conspiracy theory. Because of the UFO stigma, the response has been irresponsibly anemic and slow. The recent downing of the Chinese surveillance balloon and three other objects underscores the need for domain awareness. With the potential of security threats to our military, there's a bipartisan push to help get more information on and defense against these UFOs, or what the government calls UAP, which stands for Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. We are tracking over a total of 650 cases. Sean Kirkpatrick heads the Pentagon's new All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO. They investigate these UAP sightings, and he discussed their findings during a Senate Armed Services Subcommittee hearing Wednesday. ARO has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. No issues with aliens for now, but a real concern exists when it comes to foreign adversaries. And I have indicators that some are related to foreign capabilities. Kirkpatrick says his office follows a multi-step process when it comes to their investigations. And he says with very limited evidence, it's going to take some time to get answers on these mysteries. Alejandro Rojas, the head of research and content for Enigma Labs, a data and community platform dedicated to UAP sightings, says the government is moving in the right direction and is pushing the scientific community to do the same. He's asking those mainstream scientists who are kind of closed-minded about this topic to consider other ideas and to, to keep on the table that maybe it is aliens. We don't have evidence of that yet, he says, but it's a possibility. And the House had a similar hearing just last May. And with both sides of the aisle wanting to strengthen the Arrow office, 
it's safe to say we'll see more action on UAP in the near future. And ahead here in our next half hour, concern over a new scam involving gift cards, how thieves are targeting aspiring entrepreneurs. Plus, our team in Washington has the latest on allegations against Hunter Biden. We're following new claims of political interference in those investigations. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Classified Pentagon documents leaked to the public why there is now a delay in the suspect's trial. Then a dramatic reversal why prosecutors are dropping the charges against actor Alec Baldwin in the deadly shooting on the Rust movie set. Plus, a defamation deal. How much Fox News is paying up in the settlement with Dominion. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Thanks for being here. The decision delay on abortion drug Mifepristone this week, leaving time for debate among lawmakers in Washington. The National Desk chief political correspondent Scott Thuman joins us now with more on the political fallout. Another critical Supreme Court say on abortion in America with political fallout playing out just across the street. Republicans have one goal, one goal. They want to control women in every state and every zip code. The Democrats use it against us, obviously, in election. Well, we're doing away with abortion. While in the 2022 midterm elections, Republicans won on the top issue of inflation, the red wave they were expecting never truly materialized, since some say conservative efforts to limit abortion rights also galvanized opponents. Politico reporting abortion hadn't simply awakened Democratic voters, it was actually persuading swing voters, citing internal memos calling it a massive vulnerability for Republicans. Every time Republicans are talking about abortion, we're losing, right? Because we don't do it well as a party, right? Um, I think the next generation of, of Republican isn't, that's not a top priority for them. But that hardly means all Republicans are backing off. I'm pro-life. I don't apologize for it. We're going to continue to champion the right to life. We're going to continue to champion the interests of women born and unborn. In Florida, potential presidential candidate and governor Ron DeSantis further restricting when a woman can get an abortion from 15 weeks to now just six weeks. 
within the party worries that will only hurt the GOP in 2024. Former President Trump unusually quiet on that latest move, while President Biden tweeted, the only way to counter it, elect a Congress who will pass a law restoring Roe v. Wade. If any Republican thinks that voters have uh, simmered down on the right. abortion issue, they are wrong. That is going to continue uh, well into the next presidential race. A fight already well underway. In Washington, Scott Thuman for the National Desk. New details. The detention hearing for the man accused of leaking a trove of classified documents is now set for next Thursday following a delay this week. Jack Teixeira's attorneys asked for more time to address arguments for keeping him in court custody. The 21-year-old Air National Guardsman is charged with posting highly classified military documents in an online chat room. Also right now, defense officials aren't ruling out punitive action against Teixeira's unit on Joint Base Cape Cod. Their force inspector general is now seeking to determine whether the unit complied with procedures designed to protect against leaks. New Mexico prosecutors dropped criminal charges Thursday against actor Alec Baldwin in the 2021 Deadly Rust movie set shooting. shooting. A source close to the investigation said there is evidence that the gun used in the shooting had been modified, which could have caused it to fire unexpectedly. The film's cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed by a live round of ammunition fired from a prop gun held by Baldwin. Baldwin had pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter charges. The National Desk Eugene Ramirez went one-on-one -on -one with trial attorney Karen Conti earlier this week to discuss how the incident could change safety protocols on film sets in the future. Some shocked by the drop charges, others not so much. Helping us to make sense of it all tonight is Chicago-based trial attorney Karen Conti. Karen, good to have you back. Were you surprised? And help us understand what would lead to a decision like this. I wasn't really surprised. I think there were some problems from this case right from the beginning, even the way it was charged with that gun enhancement, which wasn't even a law in New Mexico when it was charged. And the prosecutor, as you remember, had to step down because there was a conflict of interest because she held a job as a legislator and you can't be both a prosecutor and a legislator. So when the new prosecutor came in, maybe the prosecutor looked at this and said, this is not a winnable case. Yeah. Prosecutors do not like to try cases when they lose them. Well, here's what people are saying on social media. They're claiming celebrity preferential treatment. Uh, could this be a self-inflicted black eye for the prosecutor's office? Well, you know, sometimes prosecutors like to charge people who are famous because they can make a name prosecuting famous people. So maybe he's getting preferential treatment, but he might have been charged because he was a celebrity. Mm, I do think it's an embarrassment. I do think it's an embarrassment to the prosecutor's office. No. Now, is this really over for Alec Baldwin or could there perhaps be other charges that are brought against him in the future? They could bring charges against him, but listen, that would be a really bad decision because if the prosecutors have reasonable doubt, the jurors are going to have reasonable doubt as well. Now, also originally charged in this case is the movie's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. By all accounts, she's supposed to be the expert here, the weapons expert on set. Is that why, at least as of now, she's still facing charges and he's not? Yeah, I think there's a clearer case with her because that was her job. That was her sole job to keep that set safe, to make sure those guns were not loaded, to make sure that everybody knew the guns were not loaded. So I think the case against her is is a much stronger case, and my guess is that that's going to go forward. Yeah, that's what it looks like right now, at least. Now, as they say, the show must go on. We know now that the movie is set to resume production very soon. But beyond Rust, what do you think this all means for the future of safety on film sets? Uh, lots of, of concerns have come up after this happened uh, about other film sets. Yeah, I think it's going to set a precedent. I mean, there are people who, who teach safety on the movie sets when it comes to not only guns, but when it comes to cars and fire and special effects. So I think there are going to be stricter standards. I think we're going to see written standards because we don't have any in the gun industry when it comes to the movies. And I think this is going to be, in the end, a good thing for the safety on the movie sets. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I, I, I bet a lot of actors are probably going to start checking these prop, uh, whether it's a gun or whatever else, to make sure that, you know, that what happened to Alec Baldwin uh, doesn't happen to them. Uh, well, Karen, and, why do, and why do we even have uh, loaded guns on the set at hey, all? Ever? That's, that's the question right there. Right. Karen Conti, smart analysis as always. We love having you on. Thanks so much. Take care. Looking over New York City, where a federal judge upheld a congressional subpoena for a former prosecutor in Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg's office to testify about the investigation of former President Donald Trump.
Last week, that DA, Alvin Bragg, sued Jim Jordan, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, to block the subpoena. Bragg claims lawmakers are trying to intimidate the DA's office over its Trump investigation. Jordan says Bragg's case against Trump is an abuse of power. The DA's probe is over an alleged hush money payment involving adult film star Stormy Daniels, who says she had an affair with Trump. Trump has denied the affair and pleaded not guilty to the charges. A deal is reached in the Fox News Dominion voting systems defamation case, the two sides reaching a settlement. Dominion confirms the settlement valued at $787.5 million, which is about half of Dominion's original $1.6 billion ask. The settlement came as the trial was set to begin in a Delaware courtroom. Dominion says Fox repeated false claims that Dominion's voting machines flip votes for Donald Trump in favor of Joe Biden in the 2020 presidential election. Dominion today calling the settlement an endorsement for truth and democracy. A record number of American voters now identify as independents. Earlier this week, I spoke with the fact check team about the role these voters could play in the upcoming presidential election. We are more than 500 days away from the 2024 election and candidates are traveling all over the country vying for your vote. I am back with the fact check team looking at a group presidential contenders have really focused on independent voters and Connor starting with you. How big of a role do they play in our elections? Didi a pretty big one. Independent voters are an important voting block making up about 49% according to Gallup. A lot of Americans in this group are open to persuasion and can be won over and driven away. Now let's look at last last year's midterms. It was supposed to be a quote, red wave, and we've been looking through exit polls, and a key reason it may not have been is because a narrow majority of independent voters chose Democrat candidates over Republican ones. And we should know independents represented 31% of all voters last election cycle. What about previous elections? What role did independents play there? Well, in a Bloomberg analysis, we looked at shows Republican victories in 2014 midterm elections were because independents favored GOP candidates by a 12 point margin. And this is interesting. In 2018, the reverse happened, where independents favored Democrats 54%, and that helped Democrats regain control of the House of Representatives. Great background. And Courtney, with independent voters, is there still a sense of partisanship? Didi, some independents are truly partisan, but a lot of them vote for a specific party, sometimes called leaning independents. According to an analysis by the Washington Post, it's because most leaning independents don't love the party they vote with, but they strongly dislike the party they vote against. It's a term known as negative partisanship. According to the polling website 538, about one in four voters who identify as independent are truly independent, meaning that they don't really align with either side. Interesting. Uh, election will be here before you know it. And so if you want to dig deeper into the fact check team's research, you can scan that QR code on your screens or head over to our website, thenationaldesk.com. Ahead here on the National Desk, tracking thieves, the technology police are using to locate carjacking suspects in the nation's capital. Plus, a deadly trend, one family's heartbreaking warning over a social media challenge. This is the National Desk America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From the rise of carjackings in D.C. to a gift card scam in California, we're taking the pulse of America. But we start with one Ohio family's heartbreaking warning about a potentially deadly social media challenge. I'm going to do everything I can to try to make sure another child doesn't go through it. 13-year-old Jacob Stevens died after six days on a ventilator. The worst day of my life. He overdosed on Benadryl after attempting a TikTok challenge. The challenge was to take 12 to 14 pills and it would create a hallucination. Jacob took more than that. It was too much for his body. The teen was at home with friends when he overdosed. Jacob's friends filmed him attempting the social media challenge when all of the sudden his body started seizing no brain scan there was nothing there he said we could keep him on the vent we could uh, 
you know, he could lay there like that, but he will never open his eyes. His parents described Jacob as a well-mannered, funny, loving kid. It made me feel really good to see some of the, the posts that, uh, you know, his peers so have put on Facebook about how he helped them. And now his family has a warning for other parents. Keep an eye on what your kid's doing with that phone. Talk to them about, you know, the situation. I want everybody to know about my son's situation. A normal evening, cars, dogs, baby carriages, a family unloading groceries when this red car pulls up. As I was unloading the car, uh, a man came up on the side of me and showed a pistol like, like this. With the hatch still open on the center family's BMW SUV, the carjacker is rolling. Sharp turn, heading east, the red car that delivered him right behind. But I was in shock. I didn't, I'm like, this is happening to me. Different carjacking. This video from the carjacking of an Uber driver. 176 carjacking so far this year, up 12% over the same period of 2022. And car thefts are up even more, 107% over last year. But back to the Setter family. Luckily, the air tags were logged in with my wife's phone, and she was able to show that to the police, and they were able to pinpoint where the car was going and uh, locate it. Due to the GPS tracking device, police had the car within an hour or so, but by that time, it had been involved in a shootout. The front wheel broke, and the oil pan was broken and leaking out on the ground. Brian, a victim of a scam, recently met a woman online, and they chatted by email. And she told me about uh, this guy that uh, helps people out. But you got to invest a little bit of money, but in return, you get a lot back. Brian connected with Victor Jean, who claims to represent the company. During the presentation, he showed Brian how he could be rolling in dough. But first, he had to send him gift cards. Every day, uh, it was more, more, and more. In the beginning, he bought $10 cards. But then, Victor Jean wanted $25 gift cards. He kept on asking me, well, would you like to quit? I said, well, if I quit now, I ain't going to get my money. Brian invested $450 in gift cards before deciding enough was enough. The initial promise that 16 grand would be delivered to his home never happened. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh -uh. If, if, they, if they keep pressuring you, block them. Still to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the latest on the abortion pill debate to new questions about rules governing transgender athletes. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman, the Supreme Court dealing with the abortion issue this past week. What's the political fallout? Yeah, Steve, so there is the legal fallout, the health fallout, and then, of course, as you just alluded to, the political one. And Democrats actually kind of welcome this debate because they look back at the results of the 2022 midterms and say they were down in the polls because Republicans were campaigning so hard on uh, crime issues, education, inflation, and economics. But then that overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court galvanized and energized a lot of voters who are upset about that. They helped that staved off, they believe, that so-called red wave. Republicans were expecting they think that could happen again any time this debate over abortion rights comes up, especially as you see states on a smaller level decide to either ban abortion or restrict when a woman can get an abortion. Democrats think that will help them at the polls in 2024. Republicans say, hold off. Look, we did have states that had bans that put tougher restrictions into place and Republicans did get elected or re-elected, so it has to go on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, nonetheless, it's going to amp up the arguing going into the next presidential cycle. And meanwhile, Scott, another legal issue that's turned into a political issue, new developments into the investigation into the foreign business dealings of Joe Biden, President Joe Biden's son, Hunter. What's going on there? 
Well, so now there's a lot of reporting surrounding this IRS agent and his attorney who has come forward saying that this agent has evidence via documents and emails to indicate that the investigation into Hunter Biden, whether it be for the tax issue or possibly making false statements, that those investigations have been hampered by political interference. Now, it is not clear at this point how high up that interference may go. Is there an uh, allegation that the White House, that uh, President Biden himself has some sort of finger on the scale? We don't know about that. But he wants to testify and he wants whistleblower status, giving him that protection to come forward to Capitol Hill and present evidence or testimony that would be contradictory to what we've heard allegedly from Attorney General Merrick Garland. So it's a whole new layer to this kind of complex investigation regarding the president's son and whether or not it has been tainted by politics. And national correspondent Kayla Gaskins, another political hot potato, how's Republicans passing a bill this past week that would prohibit federal funds to schools that allow transge transgender athletes to compete in women's and girls' sports? Talk a bit about the controversy playing out there. Well, essentially what this House bill does is ban transgender athletes from joining women's sports team. And the way it does that is through the Title IX funding. So it makes sure that when looking at the Title IX numbers, the amount of female athletes and therefore the amount of dollars that are being poured into these educational institutions, they're basing that off of the gender assigned at birth, not the gender that the athlete identifies as. So the language is an outright ban transgender girls from joining the team, but it does affect the money and that in turn affects the entire system. Now, advocates say this is all about protecting women and it's about protecting the um equality that women have worked so hard for, especially in the sports arena. And it's getting um, some pretty interesting advocates coming out of the woodwork here. Uh, Samantha Ponder, she's a prominent host at ESPN, actually speaking out for the very first time about this issue in a tweet yesterday. Uh, she ended her tweet with the hashtag Save Women's Sports, joining her colleague Sage Steele as, as two women at ESPN speaking out in favor of keeping women's sports with biologically born Women. Now, this seems to go against her employer, ESPN, who has traditionally been pretty pro-trans, at least in their coverage. They supported Leah Thomas, named her as an honoree for Women's History Month. So this back and forth really playing out, though, here on Capitol Hill. Democrats saying even bringing up the topic, even this debate is actually harming trans kids. Now, the bill did pass the GOP-led House. However, it will have a much tougher time, almost an impossible time in the Democratic-led Senate. And the White House has already come out and said if this bill lands on President Biden's desk, he will veto it. Steve. As always, a ton going on in Washington to keep us busy. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, chief political correspondent Scott Thuman, thank you both for your hard work. Didi, back to you. Thank you. Still ahead here, concerns over asylum claims, how the end of a public health order could impact southern border cities. In less than a month, the public health order Title 42 will expire and with it, the government's ability to quickly expel migrants trying to claim asylum. There are now major concerns about what this will mean for an already strained system. The National Desk, Christine Frizzau, gives us a first-hand look. This is uh, one of the trailways that comes up from Eagle Pass North. On his ranch in Kenny County, Texas, Joe Robinette recounts a recent encounter with a migrant on his property. He was uh, very upset and crying one morning, and I, it's against the law to pick him up, but he asked me to take him to the Border Patrol station, so I called him and got permission to take him to I-90, and they met us there. His partner was dead when he woke up that morning. 
Robinette's location puts him at the nucleus of the crisis at the southern border, where nearly 2.4 million migrants were encountered just last year. The numbers rising rapidly over the past six years, from just over 400,000 in 2017 to more than 2 million in 2022. Presenting one of the greatest challenges faced by the Biden administration. The challenge of migration that we are experiencing at our southern border is not exclusive to the United States. The massive shift in migration around the globe, including those coming to the United States, a factor that recently led the chief of the U.S. Border Patrol to make this stunning admission during a House Homeland Security hearing last month. Does DHS have operational control of our entire border? No, sir. That lack of control has left those who live near the border to bear some of the burden. When they robbed me, they said, I had 12 new pair of underwear and 12 new pair of socks, and they had they took my new socks and my new underwear. Had all my boots lined up. I came in, and they were in the house. He and others are concerned the numbers will only increase. Once Title 42 expires on May 11th, the Border Chief Jason Owens notes that CBP's first line of defense remains intact. Whether or not Title 42 is in place, Title 8 is still the primary enforcement measure that we use for border security and illegal immigration. That is always in effect and it will always be in effect. Title 42 was an emergency measure used under former President Trump during the coronavirus pandemic to try to limit its spread from those outside the country. Title 8 is actually a harsher and more effective policy, some immigration experts argue, since instead of an expedited removal, often just to Mexico, they are deported back to their home country. And if they do try to return, they will be subject to prosecution and to felony crimes for re-entering after having been returned. For now, migrants continue to risk everything, sometimes losing their lives, including two who died hiding in a train car in Texas, and 40 who perished in a fire at a detention facility in Juarez, Mexico. The road ahead for those who still make the journey and for those who live here, an uncertain one. For Spotlight on America, I'm Christine Frizzau. Right now, Netflix is preparing to end its snail mail DVD rental service. The company's original concept launched back in 1997, kickstarting what would become a multi-billion dollar streaming business. Netflix says it will ship its final DVDs to customers at the end of September, the end of an era. And that is all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on the nationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here next week.